Hello everyone, my name is Rachel Moses and you are listening to the HP Leader Podcast. And this podcast is the second part in a three series podcast looking at changing the culture of conversations for emerging HP leaders. And I'm delighted to be joined by a fantastic panel today. We've got a couple of new faces, so I'm going to ask them to just introduce themselves a little bit about who they are. Um, and what they do for a living in this AHP world. Adine, going to come to you first. Hi, good evening everybody. My name's Adine Adonis. I'm a neurophysio and I wear a clinical and a research hat. Thank you, Adine. Sharon. Hi everyone, I'm Sharon Ajay Nicol. I'm a speech and language therapist by background and like Adine, I'm a clinical academic, so do some um, uh, clinical work in private practice as well as research. Thanks, Sharon. Mushrat. Hi, my name is Mushrat Ahmed Landiu. I'm a senior lecturer in occupational therapy, and I'm also currently doing a PhD research as well. Thank you. David. Hi, my name's David Williams. I'm a rotational physiotherapist in the Midlands. I'm not a student anymore, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I'm really interested. I think this is a really important topic. So. I'm really here to listen and to absorb. So, thank you. We're delighted to have you on board, David. <laughs> Ganesh. Welcome, David. Hi, um, Ganesh Brown here. I'm the regional head of AHP for the Midlands and East of England and uh, podiatrist by background. Thank you. Jemima. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm a physiotherapist by background. I'm a first contact physiotherapist uh, with an interest in public and global health. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so I'm Steve Tone. I'm a physiotherapist um, and um, I'm AHP leader, NHS England, NHS Improvement, working in London. Thank you. And we have one non-video participant, Jo Yin. Hello, my name is Jo Yin. I am a lecturer at Brunel University, a lecturer in occupational therapy at Brunel University London, and I am the racial and cultural equity lead for my uh, school, my occupational therapy school. And I am originally from Malaysia. My work is mainly in public health, public mental health. Um, I recently led the Malaysian Health Coalition's uh, COVID-19 health communications response. Fabulous. And thanks so much for reaching out. Um, we're a non video participant because the internet's not great. So we really appreciate you being on board. So just to recap the first conversations we had for emerging leaders and some of the feedback we've had. So this was really um, to help start conversations and to help facilitate conversations around racial inequality within the HP workforce which we know that exists. And we know that exists even more since we've had feedback from the first podcast and from the conversations that have then evolved naturally and within a, a space outside of the conversations we're having today. So we decided to have a much more inclusive and open conversation by inviting anyone that wished to attend on this panel. So some of the panel members are visible, so you can see on the screen, and some of them are in a separate room um, where they can interact via chat and for whatever reason just didn't want to be visible and recorded but they're going to be interacting as well. So I'm going to start by just um, kind of kicking off around some of the really strong feedback we had from emerging leaders and some of the advice and kind of conversation starters they wanted to have in and that was around equality with regards to career progression. And there was a number of stories that really actually moved me listening and speaking to people about how they genuinely felt they'd been held back, whether there was a conscious or subconscious awareness because of their race, ethnicity or culture. And that included differences. And that really made me reflect on as a, as a white leader and recruiting manager, if I had, you know, really leveled that playing field for people who do have additional barriers. Um, and I want to start by asking the panel and, and maybe I'll come to you, Adine, first about any comments you have around that or anything you can share. Or... So career progression is always a one of those uh, career goals that you want to be able to achieve as you kind of go through life, isn't it? And 
in my situation, I was always looking for the next step, the next career uh, rung to climb because I wanted to diversify. And I had interviewed for a clinical lead job. And the job had been vacant for some time. And um, the feedback that I had gotten from after having done the interview was that um, I was too clever for my own good. And I struggled with that for a long time because I couldn't get any more sort of contextual information from that comment. Um, and long story short, I was told that I could act into the role for six months and that they would then go out to add after the six months again. And then I had a long conversation with um, the person leading the interview panel to sort of try and understand why it was not like perhaps my colleague in um, a different part of physiotherapy who had um, been offered the acting up, but with a transitional plan to become the um, full-time clinical lead for her speciality. And the response I got was, that's just the way it is. And I was sort of really keen for um, more feedback in terms of what I could improve. And unfortunately, that wasn't forthcoming in that scenario. And I must say, as much as I wanted to um, diversify my skills and, you know, improve, etc., I took a bit of a stand and sort of said, well, you know, if I'm not, if you feel that I don't have the skills uh, and that I may not um, be able to develop the skills to fulfill the role that I don't want it. And at that point, I was then told, um, you know, that was a foolish mistake. And I couldn't enter into that conversation about, hold on a minute, it's fine for one person, but not fine for another. And why is that? Because I wasn't brave enough to have that conversation at that time. And also because I recognized that I probably didn't have any allies that would help support me and back me up. And you know, that unfortunately is a really common um, feedback and story that we've had as this conversation starter. Um, jo Yin, can I come into you now, please? Okay. Yes, um, I, will, I won't take too long. Um, yeah, so before I start, maybe I, I should acknowledge first that I, I am a new migrant to this country from the global south. I am an ethnic minority in my country. Uh, well, well my, it's not just the global south, but it is a commonwealth uh, country. So we're still living the effects of uh, colonialism. I mean, should, should position myself as far as this conversation is concerned. Um, yeah, so I'm from a global south. I'm from a commonwealth country and uh, I'm a new migrant to this uh, country. Um, I have some cultural privilege in the sense that uh, in, in my country, there are some institutions where there are people, uh, where there are safe spaces uh, for people from the same ethnic background as myself. But I think one, one, one pattern that I'm starting to see talking to um, junior health professionals, newer, newer people to the health professions in this country, talking to the students, um, and also talking to people applying to our programs is that I often see people saying, I am concerned that I'm not qualified enough. I'm scared that I'm not qualified enough. And I think this is a result, I mean, especially when people grow up in settings like these where, um, what, uh, sorry, what was uh, that uh, Adin's, Adin was talking about is that um, when you have been exposed to such systems throughout your life, um, it's a form of gaslighting. You know, it's a, struct it's a form of gaslighting you get from these systems. Uh, this, this systemic oppression needs to be recognized because the system gets, gaslights you. So, um, yeah, this, I think, is, is one big, one big uh, stumbling block for many people. And even for myself, I mean, just to apply for HCPC registration here, because I trained in the Global South, a third world country, it was very intimidating you know, to be able to apply for jobs here, to be able to, you know, knowing that my chances are much lower than people in this country. Um, so, so I think, you know, also addressing that, also recognizing that, that our colleagues, you know, or the BMM, BAME colleagues in this country will be facing that mental block is also very important. I think even, um, I'm, I'm in some white feminist spaces, for instance, uh, well, predominantly white feminist spaces, and um, people like to quote Sheryl Sandberg that 
men apply for positions if they meet 60% of the requirements, while women only apply if they meet 100% of them. And I make it a point to repeat this again and again to my students or whoever is not feeling confident to apply. Just go ahead. If Donald Trump can be the president of the United States, <laughs> you, <know? laughs> so, you will do a better job at whatever you are applying for. Joanne, that <laughs> statistic came up last night on the podcast with senior leaders and that is very common. And I had four people who had quoted that and I told a story last night about I was, um, I was um, you know, managing a, a, a BAME OT, actually wasn't a physio at the time. And she's, I said, 60%, you only have to meet 60% of the JD to apply for this job. And they said, no, Rachel, I need 100%. And I says, but why? And she went, because I do, because I'm different. And I said, don't be so silly. And I used those words, don't be so silly. I remember saying it, which now is just the wrong language to use. It's not silly. It's lived experience. It's fact. She, she needed to be better because of the colour of her So that, that really reflected on me. Um, and you're so right, 60%. And anyone, my boss said this to me, anyone who's 100% of that GD is too good for that job. So you never want to be 100% of the GD because you've got nothing to learn. Uh, Dean, can I come into you then? I'm warning your lecturer, Mish, using your Twitter handle. I'm coming to you next about the systemic depression. <laughs> Could I just comment? add something about uh, onto that? Um, today, one black student was telling me that she was always being told that she needs to be 10%, uh, like 10 times better than other people. And I said, you know, yes, you do need that. I mean, I know coming from the Global South, I need that just to be able to get the visa to work here. I don't even have the right to work in this country. I need to be way, way better than a lot of people just to be able to have the right to work here and have no other local applicants to be able to work here. So yes, you go in with the expectation that you do need you go into the expectation that you know the system is against you, and, and, but you still apply for it anyway. Don't let that put you off from applying. I Love think that's that. very important. Be yep. bold. Yeah, a team. I was just going to share, um, one of the teams I worked in was the, one of the most diverse teams in the hospital I worked in. And the only reason for that is because we had a foreign trained non-white uh, service manager. And it's interesting when I look back and think about it because it wasn't a big deal for us. We were diverse and, you know, with that diversity, there's a lot to uh, harness from that. Now, when I look, uh, when I think back to those times and I look at the other teams, I recognize that they didn't necessarily have that diversity. And then you think about the impact all of that has on patient care. Yeah. So how can you understand, you know, how to uh, assess, treat and manage someone who's different in a way that is culturally respectful? Absolutely. Um, so at lecturer Mitch, I'm coming in with that Twitter handle because you just very recently tw tweeted about systemic oppression and um, I would just value your thoughts and opinions on that. Yeah, it's really interesting. And um, I want to thank you for inviting me, actually, and letting me in, because a lot of places won't let me in in these kind of webinar situations. Um, so one of the things that comes through in the literature, it's very clear that if you are from and I know this word has its, lim this term has its limitations, but I'm going to use it because it's a recognizable term. If you are from a BAME population, it's twice as hard for you to get promoted or get a job. And in your pro career progression, you only go half as far compared to your white counterparts. So you work really, really hard. You get told like a dean that you're not skilled enough or you're over skilled you get told if you're not skilled enough so you go and get skilled then when you're skilled you're too skilled and then that that is a commentary of exclusion it's actually a comment of discrimination and the other thing is that there is a hierarchy within the nhs which is very clear right if you're white you're very privileged if you're asian you're kind of in the middle. If you're black, you're at the bottom of the pile. That's the hierarchy. And there is also the thing about colorism, which is very clear as well. If you have lighter tone and you have a European phenotype, you get on better. 
in the NHS, or actually in all organisations. And this is also in literature. We don't, you know, every time an incident happens, it's like we're rediscovering racism. It's like, it's, it, why do we have to keep rediscovering racism? It is there. It's been research for 40 years. And actually the research doesn't tell us much has improved. I mean, it sounds desperate, doesn't it? But it isn't because there has been some change forward. But the white gaze, and I can't say it enough, the white gaze of privilege dominates. Mm. And we've got to, we've got to accept that, you know. I mean, if we, if we work in removing or reducing the effects of racism, it's going to benefit all of us, not just people of the BAME groups, but all of us. So why don't we do it? Well, we don't do it because if your privilege is suddenly, if you like, attacked, what do you do? You knuckle down and you put in other measures to slow down progress because you don't want your privilege to change because actually race and i keep saying this is a social construct and we can unlearn it and deconstruct it yeah that is i mean that is very powerful in itself and i think there's a couple of things i want to pick up on there um about particularly around i suppose the white privilege and what that means and even me being here chairing this panel has created some discussion about whether that is the hierarchical traditional model that exists so i want to put it out there in terms of this is an even playing field and actually this is just someone bringing everything together and start like having this open and honest conversation because with having um, a very traditional you know white privilege model within healthcare which does exist it's very visible even if people don't believe it the visibility is there and it happens in politics it happens within a lot of leadership structures within you know the uk then how can we start bringing breaking them barriers down together now i'm sorry just... rachel can i just add that it's not about individuals it's about structures and systems and policies and procedures not individuals we act and behave within that structure that makes us behave in a certain way. And I am also guilty of that. It's happened to me where I've told students, you know, just, just, you know, suppress some of that passion, suppress your color, suppress your difference, just get through that placement because when you graduate, it will be a bit more freer. Was I wrong? Absolutely. Ganesh, I'm going to come in to you, please. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think when you look back this week, hasn't it, there's been um, uh, articles around the number of um, people from BAME background in government or council positions. I think when you look across the, the healthcare system as well, the majority in senior leadership are white. So these are the guys that are writing the policies and the guidance. And that, I'm not saying that these are bad people, but clearly there's that culture aspect which they won't understand. So, and that in itself supports the argument, doesn't it? When I'm on um, video calls and I, you know, with HEIs, you know, with the professors there, the deans, the majority of white faces across both regions that I work. And the same with the senior leadership and meetings, the majority are still white faces. And that's not a criticism, that's fact, it's, it's, it's there. So, so everything that is currently going on is going to be dictated by that. So there isn't, there isn't, you know, that that role model there to change that. I absolutely agree with you, Ganesh, completely. Now, I'm going to come to Adeen for a comment. I absolutely agree. I mean, I think I might have mentioned this in either this uh, some forum um, before. If you look at the amount of black professors in the United Kingdom there's something like less than one percent and that's across all domains uh, so less than one percent and if you look at uh, the BAME population from a, a PhD level there's I know I think I've mentioned this before at UCL there's less than one and a half thousand 
in the entire uh, institution. The difficulty I think that we have is, as we've said, we have to suppress, we, we need to know when to step up, but stepping up is a brave thing to do. And it's a difficult thing to do because in order to step up, you first, you can't sound like the angry black woman. You have to be able to eloquently put your argument across, but you also need to have those allies. And if you don't have the allies, then you're just going to sound like another angry black woman, whatever you do and whatever you say. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, we need to grab at this time is the ability to move forward and i've said this before set action plans and move forward as a collective sometimes we get into this real um and this is to quote lecture mish this real um tussle within the bain population of either who's leading or what does it mean and how's it going to take us forward and what we probably need to do is agree to disagree in some way shape or form but draw together to move forward and if we don't do that we're going to have a lot of uh, inner turmoil within a group that doesn't need that inner turmoil it needs to band together to move forward yes we definitely need to, to come together as a collective effort. I completely agree. And the thing is for me, Adina, there's so many people in the leadership positions that aren't there, but this is when we need to come together to move everyone to that space. I'm going to come to Sharon, then Jemima, then Rafia. So Sharon, can I come to you? Yeah, it was just a quick point on what Adine was saying about that kind of that dichotomy of when, when do I speak up? When do I need to kind of hold it back? And I've, I often think that, you know, aside from the, 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 the usual challenges that we're all talking about, about being BAME or whatever, that I, that I do constantly feel that there's an internal battle in, in, in certain situations that you're having to have, rather than just making your point as you want to, you've, con you've also got this internal battle of, I better make sure I'm making this point in this kind of diplomatic way as I can, I don't want to come across as being too strong, and you know, you can't, you're not, you can't, be as genuine as you want to be sometimes because you don't want to come across as angry or too you know and I, th I think it's something that is unique to being BAME sometimes is that you can't it's, it's, there's constantly other internal battles going on as you're communicating or as you're trying to make a point or argue for something for your team or whatever that is um that, that, that we just have to constantly deal with and it, you, you, you sort of have this kind of I don't want to go in too strong but I do want to be really kind of passionate and sell this and whatever and it, it you know it, it's unique and it's just something that kind of came to my mind as Adine was talking that um that it is that kind of stereotype that can can be there that when it was, it, somebody from non-BAME can argue in a, in a different way and and it doesn't come across as angry but it, when it's a black person saying it you know it can, can be seen sometimes as quite negative and I definitely have experienced that in kind of sort of senior level meetings of just can't, feeling like I've had to really monitor um, how I might say something how I might argue something that I think I just wanted to kind of flag up in that context that Adina was talking there. And you know Sharon that this is what I've heard as a manager when eventually people do start to open up and do trust you and when you ask about confidence levels that's why it'll come and people will come and say things to you on a one-to-one -one separately and say well maybe I thought this or I didn't I wanted to get that point across but I didn't and I'll say well why didn't you say it and they say because I don't want to come across as the angry black woman or the angry black person and I say you know do, do you really think that and people really do mm. and I think there's probably many of managers sat listening to, listening to this or a leader and thinking no that doesn't happen that doesn't happen but it really does doesn't it mm, absolutely so thank you so. thank you so much for sharing that because I think many people will listen to you in the way you present yourself as really articulate and quiet and you know and think that that's just that's just not lived but so thank you for that and um, Jemima can I come to you next yes sure um I just wanted to piggyback off uh, what Adine said actually um and I you know I strongly believe that there are internal factors um, that influence a lot of this, you know, within ourselves as same people, we also need to do a lot of self reflection and thinking and, and, and so on. And that's not to be neglected, but also there are external factors that, um, 
that are beyond us. So we can be brave. You know, we can step out and in quotation marks, do all the right things, but that's just not enough. Um, and that allyship that um, Adine um, touched on is so important. And what Electra Mish said about systemic structures are also very important. So it's, we need a combination of all these different factors and strategies to create change. And also it's not about um, a white versus black thing. Um, because actually a lot of support that I've received has come from white males, actually. And this is personal. The most support that I've received um, in a physiotherapy world and outside of that in research has been um, from white males, interestingly enough. And, you know, I remember one time interacting with um, a, a black uh, physiotherapist and I thought, oh my goodness, I've never seen one of you before. This is amazing. Um, teach me, mentor me, show me the way. And I didn't get as warm of an interaction as I expected, which is strange, right? So um, this is more nuanced than we might like to kind of present. Uh, but it doesn't take away from the fact that there are systemic structures, there are external factors and also internal factors that we need to take as a whole. Do you know, I think that is so powerful what you've just said there, Jemima. And I think if people didn't take that on and then just need to rewind this back and listen to that and to give people a comparison if they don't believe that is as a, as a strong sometimes, you know, very loud, jawdy woman. Um, I have never, even when I've been rude, been called angry or aggressive in the way I come across. And probably um, out of everyone on this panel, the person that would deserve to get that. So, and that is my white privilege for, for, for not being called that. So I think that Jemima, thank you for sharing that. That is, that, uh, that really touches a chord with me. I'm going to come to Rafia and see Nadine. Rafia, I've got such a massive apology because you didn't get to introduce yourself and I was distracted by the private meeting room that's now got like 30 something people in. So I am so sorry, my friend. Hey, Tell me. <laughs> and I'm so polite <laughs> and I follow the rules. <laughs> so I stay quiet. <laughs> no, no, it's not a problem at all. Um, so that's, I'm it. that's it in a nutshell, right there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Rafi, I'm a speech and language therapist. Um, I'm also a researcher, so there may be a theme here in terms of branching out from your profession and, you know, exploring, diversifying, I suppose. Um, and I am doing an NHS funded PhD in digital therapy. Um, and uh, honestly, this conversation, I, I, I kind of, when Mushrat started talking about the change and where does change come from, and then talking about Adini picked up on the structure and the way of behaving, and as Sharon and Jamal carried on with that, and I'm just nodding, 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 because it's so true in terms of, I, I started thinking about the fact that as I progressed in my career, I think I learned kind of overtly and covertly there's a way to behave a way to talk a way to dress a way to belong and then you can slide through <laughs> then you then you're seen as the safe person you're BAME but you're <laughs> acceptable you fit this mold and um I, I I then started thinking about what we represent then in terms of what kind of models are we and are we then modeling to students in the next generation that if you want to progress as a BAME person what are we modeling just by our very being is this the way you need to behave you know do you need to quieten down you need to use a certain way of speaking certain terminology in order to progress in your career and is that why this pattern isn't breaking because we are just as implicit in it you know it's I, I, I completely agree with Jemima it is not a BAME non-BAME discussion or at all it is about how do we change this narrative and how to you know it's it's for all of us to analyze and think about it and um i do think that it's not just about progressing in your career and what is the ceiling and what's there but also reflecting as you go on that journey and remembering why you've worked so hard and what are the barriers for other people and how can we change that cycle um so yeah just 
just a really, really interesting conversation that I just, I was following it through and I was just seeing how it progressed and was like, yes, this just makes so much sense. And I think the common themes that exist throughout, and this is exactly why this is the first conversation starter. So you've just said that, how we change that cycle, how we change the culture of conversations, how it becomes normal to talk about these barriers yeah. and challenges, because only then can we understand as influential leaders about how we can make a difference and make the change and some of it is really uncomfortable some of it like I've done is sit and reflect and think did I do that have I done that have I consciously or done that or not done that and it only then when you recognize and realize and apologize and then acknowledge and then move on can you really start that influential change together mm. like you said it's not about the them and us it's not about you know, um, about, about trying to do everything yourself or making the big gestures. It's about the things that matter to people and you don't know that. You mm -hmm. haven't lived shoes. It, it's about how we, can, how we can use that. Now, Steve, I know you've been wanting to come in. Yeah, so, so I think there are just a couple of things that, that I was thinking about. The first is, um, so first of all, uh, well, the two things as I put them is um, the power of unconscious bias. So, uh, so I would hope um, uh, that I'm an ally but I think it's probably more honest to say that I'm an aspirant ally because I think being an ally needs to be about effectiveness and I, I'm not as effective as as I'd want to be and and um, and through some of the the journey and, and some of you on the panels here have had discussions previously that's been incredibly helpful and um, I think there's there's often there's frequently an unconscious bias challenge so if I reflect on myself I know that in previous times I've organized events and the first event, uh, the first uh, draft of the speakers of the event were uh, white and male. Now, aside from the fact we look at the gender uh, um, uh, distribution of, of, the, um, uh, of, of our professions, that's, that's ludicrous. Um, but it's understanding that, um, you know, there's got to be deliberate challenge to self around that and thinking about who, who you're surrounding yourself um, with in order to, to challenge that unconscious bias. Because um, I think all of us have, have uh, unconscious bias uh, uh, as a key feature of what we do. Um, and whether that's um, because of gender, whether it's because of, of uh, race or, or all these different features, I think that's a, a constant challenge. The second thing is, is um, something around a sort of blindness to, to, to some of this. So intellectually, um, you know, I have an understanding about the, the evidence and what we know about uh, some of this. But for example, someone like Adeen, who I've known for years, and I know the fantastic stuff she's done, the stuff she's done with Acton, really talented stuff. So it's difficult to comprehend, therefore, um, uh, Adeen's experience. And, and also to, to um, presume that it's surprising to me that she would have experiences that, that, that I'm hearing. So that's the power of the stories. Um, but even I think Ganesh and I had a conversation the other day and I was talking about, uh, we were talking about the nature of leadership and I think I said something about, um, uh, we were talking about leadership and I, I think I said something uh, within a leadership context wasn't a big deal. And uh, Ganesh just, just politely said, well, that's not the case, that's not the case for me. Um, and uh, so, so I think we can't underestimate the power of unconscious bias. And I think that the benefit of, of these conversations and the stories is, yes, we can intellectually understand some of the evidence base, but we need to see what's what's happening because because of my respect for someone like Adeen, um, then I then I my one of my biases is that I presume that many people would respect uh, Adeen and understand that. So that's one 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 of the challenges for, from uh, an aspirant um, ally perspective, I think. Yeah, and just to build on that, um, one of the things about British culture and being born in British culture and being white in British culture is this thing about privilege we've spoke about, we spoke about in the first podcast. Then it's about understanding your privilege and recognising it. Then it's about how that affects you, but also affects others because it's a barrier for others in this country. And then it's about the fragility element. So knowing that within British white culture, it is about perfection. It is about never being wrong. It is about not admitting when you're wrong. It is about always wanting to be flawless. And then the, the pressure on people to continue to be that and then not admit 
when there's challenges or not admit when they haven't done things right and not admit as a manager in a position of influence and power you haven't addressed inequality that is another thing for me that i've that i've learned and i think that is fundamental to why white leaders aren't in that space yet to really start making a difference until we're recognizing all this and i'm not an expert on this at all um you know and i think this is one of the things that we need to understand from my perspective and my peers perspective to really help move the agenda on and um, musharat can i come down to you yeah, I just um, want to talk about some of the, the thing is, we're not going to change unless we have, and this is what I, I couldn't find the word for it, and I don't like using the word for it, but just going to a lot of these platforms of discussion, it's about accountability, and like, what happened to a dean or anybody else there wasn't any accountability, was there? That no one was held to account for what was said. It was the power that they could say it and nothing would happen. So there's something about accountability and it has to start at the top because we can do what we can as a local group altogether, but actually you need sort of a joined up um, collaboration so it must start at the top with the leader leadership is really important and the leadership's got to be authentic but compassionate and then the next thing we need to do is to think about culture because if you get a leadership that's role modeling and is very clear about what is going to happen and what the policies and procedures are then you can start to tackle that really important thing about culture because when you look at and again i'm not an expert on this i must say i've just done a lot of reading and a lot of engagement with all different people and all different groups and it's just you know if we don't get the people in power to engage with this we will be forever talking about another discussion after George Floyd murder and revisiting racism again. So we need the powers that control the funding, the policies and procedures. We need them to genuinely make meaningful actions that are felt by everybody because i keep saying this then everybody benefits and that's not what's happening because accountability is really lacking and limited and not transparent you know when i went for a promotion and i got it my i was the only asian woman in this whole occupational therapy team and i had to sit and be humiliated by a conversation happening right in front of me and being nodded to by the whole group that why did you get is that favoritism that you got that promotion instead of actually i followed the rules as a good asian person i followed the rules but i was then well, it must be because of something else, not because you're worthy. And yet no comeback, no accountability. I took that conversation to my manager who was sitting there afterwards. And she said, oh, just, you know, be quiet, suck it up. You've got your promotion. Mm. Where's uh, the accountability? And there was two very specific stories that people were happy to share exactly on that same level about asking if, if when someone had got a job, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a it, one situation was where they'd actually moved up like two bands into a academic role. And it was like, it was asking if they'd been favoritized for the role. Um, and that, you know, that was a really powerful story. So, so thanks for sharing that. You're not in an isolated, um, you know, space there at all, not isolated. Ganesh, can I come into you please? Just um, going back to that point about accountability, Mushra, actually. Um, so recently I was talking to a, a colleague, um, Afro-Caribbean background, who wasn't successful in a post. And the, the, the feedback she got <clears throat> was that um, 
your attitude when you walked into the room and sat down. So this was for the interview. And the, um, so you, you're aggressive, challenging, not taking into account that she was anxious and nervous. And um, that she wore black. She was wearing a black suit, a power suit. And, and I said, you need to, you need to challenge this. And, and, and um, she, you know, the person didn't feel comfortable doing this. And I, I now think, you know, you're talking about accountability. I had a role there. You know, it wasn't my organisation. But this was a person that I would have been, that senior leader is someone I, you know, have to transact with um, currently. Um, and I could have challenged that and I didn't because I wanted to obviously smooth over a particular relationship to get some work done recently, you know, important uh, relationship. But, you know, that, that accountability doesn't, like you say, just sit with these, you know, with, with, with white leaders. You know, I had, a, I had a role to play there. And the fact that that person who was subjected to that couldn't challenge that was still doesn't feel confident to be able to say go to even to HR to say this is what I experienced in that that um, interview process um, but so it's still going on in 2020 that you know a, a black lady is being challenged like that yeah and again I you know I can get I've got pages and pages here of notes that I've taken from conversations I've had and people that have reached out about examples we can share and one of the things that people have come back for when I've asked exactly that what did it did you have an ally did you have a manager did you could you go to HR every trust has to have an equality and diversity team or officer or someone who represents and they said when we have raised it nothing's been done um and that just like hit me in the heart and it's like if you've got if you if you what people can never dismiss is how somebody's been made to feel that is your feeling that is your right to feel that and it's your right to express that and you know has anyone got any examples where they maybe have raised something on behalf of someone or for themselves and they've had a good outcome or it's been really powerful and how can how can people get into that space a dean can i come into you Sorry, I probably put my hand up too quickly. I've had an outcome that wasn't as positive, where I was Not trying to support. Um, and I think to touch on a, a point that Steve and Ganesh brought up, it's about having that same safe space. So sometimes what we do, or what I definitely do, is I go back into my shell. I go and hide out because I feel so battered and bruised. And part of me thinks, well, maybe I should just keep quiet and tootle on because, you know, I'm never going to win this battle and definitely not going to win the war. And that's what, um, and then when you feel a little bit more brave coming up and coming out and finding people like Steve, who is welcoming and open, but more importantly, finding those safe spaces. And then to ch touch on Jemima, which I know Rachel is moving away from what you want to talk about but just one second and then touching on J Jemima's point of it has been people perhaps outside of your sort of self-identified um, group that has been offering you the support but those are the people who are comfortable to do that who have nothing to lose who recognize that in you and I, I must say that those people are very few and far between so first point, Adine, don't apologise for moving the conversation off piece. That's your right to do that. This is our conversation. But you've just made a really great connection there with Jemima because Jemima, like you said, um, you have some of your um, sort of really positive experiences being with white males who have really supported you. Can you give us an example for all of the people like might be listening, what that what good looked like to you? This for me? Okay. Um, yeah, so I think what I've observed, I'll talk about kind of non physiotherapy. This was um, when I was doing my master's, and it was actually sponsorship. So, not necessarily mentorship, um, but putting your name out there, um, recommending you for something, recommending you for a job, or recommending you for. Um, for further studies at that point in time, it was uh, for a PhD, um, you know, and just meeting up with me and saying, actually, do you know, what? I see something in you. 
and what do you think? And I had huge imposter syndrome, like, what do you see? I don't understand. Um, and I was trying really hard to convince him actually that he doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, but he, you know, he said, do you know what, there is something here and um, this is what I have on offer. Are you interested? Uh, and I think within the NHS, we don't talk so much about sponsorship, really. We talk a lot about um, mentoring, which is good, um, and coaching, which is also good. Uh, but sometimes, it, you know, putting someone's name forward is actually really helpful. Um, and recognizing um, skills that, that they have uh, and calling that out, you know, or just even telling them. Uh, but for this particular individual, um, he essentially sponsored me, um, which I think was, was really helpful. Well, I have yet again learned something from you, Jemima. I think that is such a powerful point. And one of the things about these podcasts and chats is that people have took things away that they've implemented or thought about or learned about. So thank you for that. That is a really, that, such an interesting different approach that mm. it can be adapted specifically to help support and empower someone that maybe the other traditional channels don't work because for some people things just don't work thank you Rafia can I come into you then I'll come down to you Sharon um yeah I guess again just picking up on what Jemima said um going beyond the mentoring and I guess promoting you and giving you that stamp of approval. And then that opens doors because, okay, so if that person believes in this person and that person's supporting and that person's giving them a platform, then, okay, we will support as well. And we will kind of uh, take, take on somebody's using their credibility and extending it to you. And I think that's really, really, really powerful and putting themselves out there and doing it really openly. And I found that helped me so massively. And um, I guess a similar situation to Jemima in that um, when I moved from clinical work to clinical research work, and I did it through, um, so I applied for um, a National Institute of Health Research grant. And it was a stream that was specific for non doctors and dentists so non-medical professions so it's mostly allied health professionals who apply for it very 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 few BAMES um, in the year that I was granted I think about 300 people applied to BAMES myself and another person was successful so very very few BAMES and I could not find I wasn't actively seeking a BAME supervisor but they just didn't exist there weren't any in my fields at all so I had a huge group of supervisors mentors allies who supported me I'd say between 15 to 20 uh, people and anyone who knows their IHR process you have to have imposter syndrome you have to excel you have to promote yourself you have to say this is what I'm going to achieve I'm going to be a leader in the field this is how I'm going to do it and you just have to do it that's the process and that's the expectation and I'd say it was mostly white males that I learned from in terms of how to do that um, they they have that skills I say they huge stereotype but I, the, the allies and the people who taught me how to do that were, were non-BAME there were people who um, kind of knew how to do it and they helped me and supported me but it was beyond that they uh, the fact that they supervised me and I could use that really helped me because I could promote so once I had one supervisor I'd approach another supervisor so this person is supervising me they've um, recommended that I contact you would you consider and you can see the snowball effect once you have one or two people in that level in that kind of position of power coming on board then it's easier for others to say yes um, and also I just wanted to so that's how my kind of I guess like Jemima said the sponsorship area started and then um i extended from that actively started seeking out BAME representation because i became more and more aware of i was in a position that not many BAME people were in a position to be and what am i representing what am i showing what am i doing now that i'm in this position so i um became part of a network called the shuri network and honestly i can't champion them enough okay i wish i was like a cheerleader with my you know bonbons because it's been so amazing and what was really really good is i found out about them through um there's a digital pioneer network in london um nhs network and i uh, applied for that 
completely out of my kind of comfort zone, completely out of my league even <laughs> in terms of applying for it. But I did it to get into their NIHR process. So you have to apply for these things. I just did it. I got on there and the person leading um, uh, is called Yinka. She's, she's moved on to another role now at NHSX. And she is such a supportive person in terms of she will go out of her way. She will call you in the evenings and, and not just just anyone who's on her team <laughs> she, she's that kind of person and she um, kind of again put us in touch with the Shuri network which is only just starting and the Shuri network came about because there were very very few female BAMES in digital health and um, the people on there so Sarah Armani and Shira Choke medical director CCI was very very again high in their field and they were aware that there were very few Fames at their level and they want to support others to get to that stage and honestly if, if you want examples of good practice and action and things that can really be done that make a change that's the Shuri network through and through and um, if anyone ever wants to get in touch I could give you a whole list and I'd be happy to chat through with you as would Shira as would any of the members of the network everyone's so open and happy to support and really practical I mean just one example as on the back of that I was invited to talk at the NHS Leadership Summit. Never ever ever would have happened in my clinical role as a band seven band eight therapist working my way up. There was, there's just no way that would have happened whereas part of the Shuri Network they promoted me gave me that platform and then that led on to other things and other things. So sorry I can go on and on and on. Well, because, well, well, this is, this is exactly that. why you're here. So Raffia I'm just going to pick up on something and be completely honest with everyone and I hope this strikes a chord with even just one person. So when I was in my emerging stage of my leadership career, I would not have given up my credibility for anyone and I wouldn't have given it to a BAME AHP, physio generally, because that was the, my leadership career. Um, and that was because I didn't want to trust anyone with it. I was on my own leadership career, my own pathway, my own professional pathway. And I looked back and I recognized that in myself as I got to my senior leadership career. And that was really hard pill for me to swallow because you, the words credibility you've just used there in terms of giving that up and allowing, being, allowing someone to use your credibility and standing alongside them and giving them that platform and that push that is exactly what is needed here for people who have additional barriers because of the color of their skin. And that for me is a really powerful message to get across to people. And I have been there, I've been that person, um, which is, is horrible to admit, but it's really important that we do. And it's really important that I say that because that, that's what you've just described is exactly why that is needed. Sharon, can I come to you please? Yeah, and it was just to kind of tap into um, what some of what Jemima was saying about sort of sponsorship. And, and for me, some of, some of this is about the kind of the processes that currently exist around developing people who are kind of just quite broad, they're kind of supervision models or coaching, mentoring, and they kind of, perhaps there hasn't been that nuance about thinking about the kind of support that fame people might require. And I think we've touched on the fact that a lot of us have this imposter syndrome and I know people have that, you know, not across, you know, when they're newly qualified or whatever, but there's probably an additional sense of that when you're BAME and kind of sometimes the kind of supervision reflective models of kind of wanting you to come up with ideas yourself about what you might need, that potentially doesn't work so much when you're coming from a background of not being very confident, not feeling you should be there and not, and sometimes you need that slightly more directive kind of approach to, mentoring or coaching which is kind of you can do this like sponsoring you putting you know putting pushing you a bit forward as, as opposed to kind of that kind of well, what do you think you need what do you kind of which I think the, some some of the NHS processes around kind of supervision tend to be more about people finding their supporting people to find their own way which perhaps can work for people that come from a slightly more privileged kind of confident background but when when you're when you're back and when you're buying often you don't have that confidence to kind of think you're ready for things you're not going to come up with the idea yourself and you need someone to kind of just say do this I'm going to put you forward for this kind of thing that perhaps you wouldn't do in you know so I think um it's about kind of the discussions around is are there different approaches that are needed for different for different people in the workforce um and kind of different models of um development supervision mentoring coaching that, that we kind of can explore for, for, for different people um, 
so I think just kind of that was just something I wanted to kind of reflect on in terms of the, the processes that set you, the marker for, for things. you are completely right Sharon and that is about leaders regardless of colour um, leaders of all backgrounds to have the confidence to ask those questions linking into what Ganesh said before and if we really want to embrace this term leadership which is a term that I struggle with as a term it's more of a culture and a concept isn't it um, then that's what we'll have to empower people to be able to do at early stages in the career hence this podcast is for this emerging leader group have the confidence to say go directly and ask do you need specific does this work for you, do you need a specific step? is there a way we can embrace this together how can we learn together how can we learn from each other mentor and reverse mentor and there's lots of different concepts out there that can that can and by speaking to fame role models people who have made it into those leadership positions and into those senior executive positions. How did you get there? What worked for you? How can we bring people along? That is, that mm. is really, really important. And then, and then having the openness and the transparency to know when you don't know what to do. And that's how I started. I just didn't know. I recognized and thought, how, how am I going to learn? And that's when my mentor came in. And that's when, when I, I reached out to a fame mentor. And that's when I learned probably most about my journey as well as, as reading, like, um Adine was mentioning before now I'm going to come into Joy in and then I'm going to come down to Adeen Joy in have you got any um examples you'd like to share we've got some stuff in the chat here yeah mine are mainly well whatever uh, a lot of the support that I have had in this uh, in the UK context generally comes from people from BAME people um, and then they then open doors to white allies. Um, but I, I, I say the starting point for all of them started with fame people. I mean, um, just to, uh, for instance, applying for graduate school here, I have a, uh, a mentor in occupational therapy who is a Japanese Canadian. And uh, he, he is uh, one of the leaders, one of the, the, like, the most prominent leaders in this profession worldwide. So I was very lucky to have a mentor like that uh, from a very early stage of my career. Um, and like you said, it was because I reached out. I actually found him through Facebook. <laughs> and um, so social media is very powerful. Um, to adjust to the UK academic climate, it was because um, a professor in, an, a BAME professor in the, she's currently a professor, but she wasn't before um, at that time, in the University of Dundee, uh, added me into a, face, uh, a Facebook group, uh, for, which was predominantly white female academics and that's where I will learn things like Cheryl Sandberg's is, you know men apply for for stuff when they reach 60% of the qualifications and things like that so um, these leaders were crucial in terms of opening these doors and I mean the reason why I'm holding the position of uh, race and cultural equity lead in in my department is also because uh, of my brave students who spoke up as a whole when um, the the school of occupational therapy was um, quiet uh, in the face of uh, George Floyd's murder. They were saying, why is there nothing? You know, they, they wrote in and, you know, students were asking for, asking for a sign of solidarity, of support. And, uh, you know, I, I had picked up things from social media because I like social media and social media is one of the areas of research. So, so I had already um, sent, you know, um, sent emails to my division lead, uh, the program leads. Uh, I was saying that look, we have to do something. This is going on. And the response only came quite late, apparently, because um, there was, uh, uh, apparently this was, this was what was said in a staff meeting, that, that there were people external to the university who had highlighted this also to the leaders. So if it weren't for the support of my students, you know, to, to also um, lobby for this, you know, I wouldn't be in this position that I am to be able to create change for them. So like Adin says, you know, we need to have these environments um, where people can support and uplift each other. And leadership is not just something that you need to be in a position to have. I mean, my students, you know, um, structurally, we would say that students have less power than us. But the collective power of uh, my students and the initiative, you know, and the leadership they showed, you know, was uh, what enabled me to uh, do the work for them to help to create a more racially and uh, culturally equitable environment. So that has kind of become the culture we have now. And my, my colleagues, you know, the, the white lecturers, they are reading things like why I don't want to talk to white people about race by Rennie Edel Lodge. 
they are you know reading things like white fragility and they are actively thinking of ways to make change in even outside um, in the professional body outside of our uh, our school so so it, it does take collective action and it does take coming together and does take people helping each other uh, using the privileges that they have absolutely and you've kind of this is just um conscious of time slightly we've been talking for an hour now i don't know where the time goes um but one of the big things the big themes that came back is how can emerging leaders change their behaviors what do they need to do this is where i get a little bit annoyed because it's it's the quick fix it's the what can i do what is the gesture what is the effort this is about inherent behavior this is about culture this is about organization everything we've talked about and David, I'm going to come to you. So you got a chance to get prepared um, by even just listening to this conversation. What do what do you need to change in your behaviour, if anything, and what how can you be better, Musharat? I'm going to come to you um, to ask for comments on that. I think um, just listening to, to all those stories was, was you know really insightful. But I think it was that whole does this work for you? that sort of question and I think it's it's trying to be mindful and actually be compassionate and try and have those open discussions um, so it was interesting to, to also hear about the um, that sort of sponsorship I think sponsorship was a bit like I guess allyship or something and the way that if, if you've got privilege then you can open doors and you but I think it's just being like genuine compassionate and trying to li just to be just to listen you know so i thought i took that does this work for you and race it down because i thought that was a really good starting point i think and i guess if, if we all try to 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 do that then we'll build better you know compassionate teams and and cultures which is what we need in the nhs thank you mushrat oh you're on mute i'll unmute you Oh, still. <laughs> the first time. Okay, sorry. The computer's trying to say something to me. Um, one of the things, I, I tell you, one of the things that is uncomfortable, but probably a good thing to do, is not to make mandatory training of everything, like unconscious bias, which I think is an outdated thing. I think what you need to do is have equity training. But the thing is, don't make it mandatory, make it voluntary. Then you will see your allies because mm -hmm. the ones that turn up are the ones that are going to support you. Don't make it a tick box exercise. It doesn't work because you don't know who, who is genuine and who's not. Make it voluntary. And then the ones that go are your allies. But also, there's some threads I just want to make clear is that Bain people are not looking for handouts or support from other uh, more privileged groups. We want the field leveled up so we can do it for ourselves. Yes, just like everyone else with privilege is doing it for themselves. We're not looking for handouts. We're not. So it, it, I always get worried when there are stories and they're good stories and I'm not going to take that away because I've had that kind of support as well. But I'm also clear that in my head that I don't want those stories to become part of the narrative because I want equality and equity to be part of the narrative. And, 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 and to start off by knowing who's your ally is to not make certain uh, training mandatory make it voluntary and then you'll see where you can turn to and everything has to be individualized i like that david said is this all right for you is this the way you want it to go for you that is very important because bain gets lumped in you know what does black mean what does the b mean is it black african black caribbean what, what is it you know um, I'm a child of the 70s. I identify as black, although I'm Bangladeshi and Asian on those census things. But, you know, black was a political word and there was a lot of fight going on in the 70s. So, you know, black was black and Asian. 
but what does minority ethnic mean? We forget about the gypsy community. They don't have colour, but they're still a minority group. Where do they come in? Does Bain cover them as well? So, you know, the, these are conversations we have to go into. And these, that's three levels. Find out who your allies are by not making training mandatory. Make sure that what is being put in place is about levelling up the field so we can do it for ourselves. We're not looking for handouts. We're not looking for privileged support to push us forward. We want to do it ourselves, you know, and that's what we need. And we need to look at BAME. You know, BAME is a term that help, is well known and helps with data collection, et cetera, et cetera. But even in the data collection, you have to separate these things out. But also, when you are having conversations, don't say BAME, say black, Asian, ethnic minority, mm -hmm. so that people see that you see difference. And I think it's that culture, ethnicity, race, it's everything that's combined and some of the lessons that I've learned from people, because they are lessons from people, that individual, that important is around that, is around the cultural differences and the ethnic differences that exist and not like, um, you know, like pigeonholing people into specific compartments because it fit, fit society or a model. Um, can I'm going to come to Ganesh and then Adine and then um, Joyin. Did you mind? Did you did you want to jump? In? Were you going to say oh. something? No. Yes, but it's fine. <laughs> okay, okay. Sorry. Ganesh, Jemima. Okay. Um, just just a, just a, a small challenge to my sure. I, I think I, I I agree in terms of that level playing field. A lot of feedback I, I've had when I've spoken to colleagues is that they weren't aware of the opportunities. So when, the, you know, it's all, uh, talking about leadership positions or career progression, it's always been, I wasn't aware that this was available. So it, I think sometimes I, I agree that, that, you know, it's not for privileged people to pull that out, but I, I think before we do level that play, playing field out, it's understanding how you provide the opportunities or make the opportunities clear for people from black, Asian, minority backgrounds. That, so just, ju just that there. And, and I think also as well, because um, it, it, it very quickly, you talk about the sponsorship, it, it very quickly becomes a, you know, it, you, know, the, you know, the white ally thing, I think can also flip and become a negative thing as well. So it's saying, ah, oh, this person's good for, this is not what we want. We want that across the board. So it isn't just about that. Um, regardless of the background, it's about all throughout uh, the leadership team, or even with your own team, who's been in that department for a number of years. It's, it's, it's that <laughs> being human and being a friend to a colleague and saying, did you realise that this was available? Yeah. Absolutely. Jemima. Yeah, um, I just wanted to piggyback off what uh, Lectra, um, Lectra Mish said about unconscious um, training, bias training. Um, and this is from um, Roger Klein, the author of um, Snowy White Peaks. Um, I was part of a webinar that he was, he was essentially in and spoken, and he said, um, based on evidence, that's one of the least productive things that actually produces results when it comes to um, diversity. And actually what is effective are things like you know, when it comes to res, res data, uh, when it comes to CQC, you know, if you attach CQC rating, right, to diversity and how diverse a trust is, uh, you're more likely to get people's attention. Um, you know, things like clarifying the role of BAME networks and senior leadership and trust or organizations, uh, not lumping everything on BAME networks, funding them, for example, supporting them, that's accountability, exactly. Um, and, and that's different from just having these conversations. Essentially, he said, we can have all these conversations, which are, you know, very important. But, you know, since he wrote his book till now, there hasn't been much difference, right? Because um, we need to be accountable to create those changes. So. Absolutely. Um, I completely agree. And this is this is kind of moves on to the next 
then final session so I will touch on it and then everyone's going to have the opportunity to bring stuff in um, that we might maybe have missed out on important points they want to say but Jemima that that comment around training and education and uh, for the equality and diversity training that I've done in various trusts I've been around a bit and I've worked in a number of organizations and I often wonder who writes it and um, and um, how meaningful it is and is it a process is it a tick box um, probably yeah from from the white person that does and has to learn so really how are we going to make impactful difference like everyone said well this is about bringing organizations together this is about bringing our profession together and, th and putting all of our heads together as a professional group and one of the big things is what needs to happen next is a long-term plan to address racial inequality within the allied health professionals and that is really bold isn't it when do we ever really do anything as a whole pro professional group and um, per se but that that is the ask that I have and it's not an asking we're going to dictate together as panelists or as people but bringing people together and saying what is going to be meaningful here for people who have that lived experience the allies that we've talked about the leaders that are really believe passionately that change is now that it's not something for the next generation that it's not something that after Black Lives Matter, we'll just become silent and we won't have to worry about it after more and more. Once COVID is over, we won't have to worry about it. So being really bold and saying, this hasn't worked. We've had the Equality Act for over 10 years now. We've had the res data for five years. We know the facts, we know the evidence, we know the statistics, but no, there's been no meaningful change So now. So this is the call that I have to my allied health professional leaders across NHS England, NHS Improvement, Health Education England, the networks, the professional bodies to say, can we please come together for the third and final podcast of this, of this title? There might be more, that's up to you guys. Um, but can we please come together? So that, that is my ask from the people that are li listening to this for free on People's Evening. Again, these are all busy and you've given up your time to educate people like me free so that's my ask so what I'm going to do now is go around and I'm going to ask people to comment on that or have any final comments or anything else they'd like to say and I'm going to come to um joining first please okay yeah sorry <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I was, uh, I had actually prepared some, yeah, as, as you were talking, I had prepared some thoughts, you know, about uh, some of the things in terms of a lasting change. Um, I'm going to address a few earlier things first. Um, uh, first of all, I, I, I just wanted to say that I don't think that there's any shortage of uh, BAME leaders in this country. I think that there are many, many capable people uh, in the health professions who are BAME. And, uh, you know, just everybody should be mindful that, you know, just, just ask ourselves, you know, are exclusionary systems obstructing them, you know, and um, uh, with regards to uh, Mish's training uh, about, you know, not, uh, sorry, sorry Mish's uh, opinion about not making it mandatory, I, I think, I mean, this is suppose where we have, um, you know, we have diversity in the BAME community and we don't speak for everybody. So I, I do personally think that it is important to have some form of mandatory training because um, especially we, we had students who, who said from their first day of class, they felt excluded by their white classmates. So there needs to be structurally uh, something, you know, um, forcing people to need to confront um, these, uh, these elephants in the room. I think at, at, at a certain point, maybe, maybe before they get out to practice, you know, because I think this is a fitness to practice issue. And, you know, like, uh, I think Jemima, J Jemina was the one who said that, um, not that it's not just unconscious bias training, it's, uh, you know, and, and perhaps we take a step further from equity training because our students have taken, um, you know, uh, equality training from uh, the Open Athens and diversity and equality training from Open Athens. And we found that it wasn't enough. It really didn't work. We still have microaggressions happening from our white students to our BAME students. So what we're doing now in um, my uh, division, my OT uh, school, is that we're doing allyship training. 
to ally is a verb and to know how to support each other. And I think allyship is uh, something that we've been talking about, There's something which uh, a lot of the colleagues just now have been talking about, you know, that they have been supported by our white allies and knowing how to support each other, uh, recognizing, you know, our unconscious bias at first and then knowing how to support each other is important. Um, and then all, we've talked a lot about how people need to see role models. I think it's important to remind people that white students or white people new to the professions, the health professions need to see role models too. So we need, you know, it's important for our white colleagues to be able to model that to, you know, um, other people who are newer to the profession. But again, it's a very fine line, you know, to, uh, it's very important to avoid white severism. And uh, this, is, this is another whole complex issue, which uh, I, I encounter a lot, you know, coming from the Global South, people who think they're here to rescue my home context, coming here to research us and things like that. But I'm not going to talk about that today. Yeah, um, but, but I think that's very important. I think that happens here with BAME communities uh, in this context as well, you know, um, white severism. So knowing how to draw the line is very important. So I think one recommendation I would make is to read me and White Supremacy is a book by a black British author. Um, and I think what is important is uh, to know how to recognize the expertise of uh, these BAME leaders, which you already have here in the UK, and to give them the mandate and make structural changes like um, what my line manager did, you know, to make the space to have our, our racial and cultural equity working group. You know, she makes the space for me to do my work. She no, doesn't cause unnecessary obstructions, which I think is very important. Because I've seen a lot of circumstances where, uh, you know, somebody says, oh, come and do this. And then they cause a lot of unnecessary obstructions for you. And you just really can't get the work done. So making the space for them to work is important. And supporting them when they need it is important. And uh, again, just to reinforce what Mish says, having that accountability. Um, my colleagues know that I, I feed back to the students in terms of what we are discussing in meetings with regards to the race and cultural equity efforts. and the, the students know that I feed back to my colleagues. So it happens both ways. And I think that transparency in terms of communication is very, very important in order to build trust. And I think, you know, um, these are what are needed for that sustainability and long-term change, you know, that, that structural space, making that space for the leaders to step up and do what they need to do. Structural change together. I love that. Adine. I think the sustainability of change is always going to be an issue. And like we said at the start of the podcast, and I think at lecture Mish mentioned it, why do we need to have an event happen, a horrible event happen for us to ignite these conversations? These conversations need to be happening all the time. The difficulty I think we have is how can you know the question is we want a platform we want to be included and all these wonderful things that's great and we need to be however if we've been bashing on about it and trying to climb this massive hill for such a long time why are we still not being heard and it goes back to some of the questions that we've perhaps individually had is I don't feel my voice is being heard. I'm not, uh, I've got no voice. And why in 2020 are we still um, channeling around the same kind of issues? So in terms of addressing it, we need to understand the context from, from the structure, I suppose, which is, you know, why, whatever i say why are you not hearing it is it in a language that needs to change or be different or is it just not part of your priority system and if it's not part of your priority why not so i think there's a lot of understanding that we need to have in order to be able to tackle it and move forward but again a, a lot of chat is brilliant however it is still up to us, all of us collectively being able to put down the action points and see that through and the action points need to be measurable so it's wonderful sitting around a table uh, and coming up with an action plan but what does it actually look like in real life what will make the changes what will make the difference to people's lives to people's uh, career progression to people's experiences and satisfaction and those are the key things we need to think about
Yeah. Is it in your priority plan leaders? And if not, why not? Okay, we've moved around a little bit. I'm going to come to Ganesh next. And you should say about the priority plans. There was a, a big national meeting this morning. They were talking about our priorities going forward. And none of the slide decks have mentioned anything about this. I raised that as a question. And in the afternoon, um, they were highlighting the programs they've got available. Um, I think it is about, um, you know, exactly what um, the others are saying, putting resource behind it, making it meaningful, don't just, don't, not just tokenism, um, allow a safe space for, for, for people to sit and have these conversations, not just have, you know, someone from Indian background or black background to lead on this, get groups of like-minded people together and give them that space to discuss that. And, and I've pinched some of that from a colleague I was speaking to earlier as well. Um, I think lis listening to colleagues as well, um, rather than directing them uh, and, and make, make it happen um, in, in the first place as well. Um, and so it does mean that some of these leaders will need to be brave and make decisions which appear unpopular. And I think that bravery, again, I, I, when people ask about heroes, I have a lot of sporting heroes, music heroes, but I still look at my son and, and the things that he does and, and as a role model as well as a seven-year-old and how he, how he includes, you know, the children. Well, it's getting to me now, uh, but, you know, it, he, he would um, let the popular kids go and play elsewhere because they were leaving a child out and he went and played with them and now he's become very friends with him. So I think it, it, it shows that we're capable of doing that uh, and we need to carry that through. It doesn't. It, do, it stops because we we suddenly become cowards in that sense. Thank you for that, um, David. How, how, I'm so sorry, David. How how do you follow that? Um, maybe something that you've learned, or just be completely honest, please, in this space. No, I think that from just to follow up from that, I think we need to be brave, and you know. It, you know, if Ganesh's um, son can do it, um, we all can, you know, and I think that was a really brilliant example. So, you know, um, we all can. And I think it's that as well from 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 talking about this really important topic. You now we need action. So and for that action to happen, I think we all need to be brave as leaders. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So Rafi, I'm going to come to you because I'm conscious of time. My lovely friend who I missed out at the beginning. I'm so sorry. All right, that's all right. I've got a little one on a timer. That's all. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking about this. And I was thinking about the journey I went on as thinking about speech and language therapy as a career option and uh, kind of the root of initially thinking about medicine and thinking about pharmacy and optometry to so quite traditional um, Indian career choices and doing placements. I think mm, they're not quite right for me. So then um, speech therapy was suggested, did a placement, enjoyed it, went on the course and then went through this whole shock to the system, this whole awareness that I was a minority, couldn't see other examples of people like me doing something like what I was doing, um, lots of confusion, kind of questioning who I was, my identity, seeking the answers, then going out and looking for other people in similar situations, but looking at um, people who were experts in the field, writing books, you know, all of that, that whole journey. That was nearly 20 years ago. It's still happening. Students are still going through that same experience. Why is that still happening? And the allied health professional, you can't get away from the fact that if you're a BAME, you're a minority in this profession. And actually, that's really, really crucial because that has an impact on patient care <laughs> because the majority of patients, especially in London, are BAME. And so I think actually that should be part of the training. That should be part of the student experience. It shouldn't be a case of let's wait till students come to that realization, go through that whole cycle, whether you're BAME or not. Um, I've had conversations with non-BAME colleagues and they've said the same thing, particularly um, students who've maybe had previous careers in other professions. So I was speaking to a colleague who worked in the tech field before she went into speech and language therapy. And she said she couldn't believe how many females there were and how many non-BAMES there were compared to her previous role. And I just feel like 
formal acknowledgement and beyond that that should be part of that very early on don't wait till people go through this whole confused state <laughs> let's acknowledge it right from the beginning and actually it is crucial and it's vital to how we are as a healthcare professional because it has a direct impact on the care we provide so it has to be part of our training because to be a good clinician you need to acknowledge this whether you're vain or not so i think rather than waiting for rather than putting that responsibility on that vain person take it the other way and put it into the training acknowledge it right from the beginning acknowledge that this is the history this is why we are where we are this is what's being done to, to change this is why change is so slow have guest lecturers have people come and speak have clinicians come and speak have theorists come and speak um, give that confidence to have those conversations between BAME and non-BAME students from the beginning because why why are students still going through that journey <laughs> why is that you know that not changed so I just feel that I don't know it's an idea but I think the data is there the research is there there are people there who can um, like Rachel you could you could go and speak <laughs> you know on these courses and just talk about what why you've got to where you are and why you're so passionate about this and that would be so powerful to somebody sitting there right at the start of that journey and feeling lost and confused and isolated and start that conversation if those students can have that conversation together how powerful is that if they continue on and whether wherever they're going to work so and yeah sorry the, waffling again no, too much coffee it, it, do you know the student thing so if you remember at the very beginning we were going to have four strands and one was going to be students and students mm. no students were happy to come into this type of space mm. and have that conversation and mm. then one of my fame colleagues um a lecturer undergraduate lecturer offered to host it in that it still wouldn't come into that space so students is a is a huge huge challenge and mm -hmm. I, I hear it so that's something else for maybe us to think about yeah. Ganesh I'm mm -hmm. going to give you um the right to come back in here did you want no, to say something it wasn't a challenge actually again this, the accountability thing so um this, uh, leading a, a discussions around simulation work and how simulation based education can help in multidisciplinary um profiles can reduce barriers to MDT work and let further down the line why haven't I thought about what Rafi has just said, actually, you know, like you say, we're breaking down barriers so we can work as multi-professionals. Yeah, she's just <laughs> articulated something so simple there about having those conversations with students, you know, at that, at that um, level as well, which would, you'd think, break down barriers and break tensions when they're working together in professional things. So thanks, Rafi, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> and that would be great to build on for podcast three in this space with this panel. So that would be amazing. Jemima. Sure. Um, what I have to say is really simple, actually. Um, and my message to those in power, to those, you know, to managers, policymakers, those that have influence on, uh, on, you know, systematic structures, systemic structures, historical structures, is that we've had these conversations before. We have the research. Yes, there's more research to do. I'm sure there's more conversations to be had. But is there real will to change? Like a genuine will to change? And if there is, where's the proof? I hear you. I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm, the next few weeks will tell, I think. Not the next few days, the next few weeks and then months. So I really hope the will is there, Jemima. I really do. Steve. Um, so, so this is exactly the sort of things that um, I'm puzzling on uh, from London perspective and, and some of you uh, uh, pre-COVID uh, have been part of my discussion and, and, and thoughts about this. So from a London perspective, um, we'll be looking to pull together an action plan, see how we can, uh, how, how we can address some of this. Part of that will be uh, some of the leaders that have come up in London that are on part of the podcast we'll be seeing if we can then um, ask if you'd like to be involved in some of that and um, but some of the early thoughts that we're, we're thinking about is um, think about things that can be measurable in terms of change because I think those are uh, useful um, uh, drivers some of those measures uh, some of our big ambitions are whether in actual fact we can use um, re recruitment and retention to AHP's careers as um, a public health intervention looking at social determinants of health work and education we know we've got deprivation challenges and we know uh, that the uh, proportion of AHPs in uh, careers in London 
uh, from the uh, baby community doesn't match the uh, representation in the population, seeing whether that, that could be a lever for change. So wouldn't it be fantastic if simultaneously we can have a, an effect on health inequalities? That's a big ambition. Um, but I think, um, but I think, uh, I guess one of the things that's, that's quite, that was quite interesting for me to hear is around the evidence base around um, uh, unconscious bias training, because I would say for me personally, that's the biggest feature of my life because the mistakes I make, and I do make mistakes, um, uh, and the discipline that I have to apply, I feel is challenging the, the things that I don't know, the mistakes that I don't know that I'm making. Um, so being conscious of who am I surrounding myself with, uh, uh, who am I, uh, yeah, who am I surrounding myself with in terms of putting on events, understanding that I, I can make mistakes around how uh, I construct stuff and um, about being inclusive. And I think, um, you know, if we take the example of, of, of um, uh, Ganesh's amazing son, um, just, just to say, you know, I, I feel that there's, you know, intellectually there's things that I may know, but we're overcoming these visceral challenges and understanding how do we, um, uh, how do we support inclusiveness and, and addressing these things. So I think if we get some hard measures in place, and um, if we can make sure that we've got the right sort of leadership for those pieces of work, if we can keep listening and talking, um, and if we can link it to what we're actually trying to achieve for the populations that we're trying to support, maybe that's the health service advantage that maybe a law firm may not have, that maybe it's aligned with what we're trying to do for populations as well, uh, then then let's hope. And just, just to say, you know, I know we're focused on uh, the thing that's been loud at the moment is, is the stuff with George Floyd, but, you know, last year, we, we had a pandemic of violence in London um, linked to, uh, uh, um, to to race and deprivation. So we always have these burning platforms, but it's just trying to put together um, an action plan um, uh, at the moment. So that's that's me. I'm going to have to scoot because I've got a baby I've got to do my shift with. Thanks, Steve. And thanks for joining me. And thanks for being brave. Thank you. Musharat. Sorry, yes, I just wanted, I've got a few things to say, I hope I have time to say them, that's all. Um, uh, I think the, the thing that Steve was talking about, the violence last year, the George Floyd murder, the COVID-19 PHE report, it really says race inequality kills. That's the important, it's killing people. You know, you can't just have nicey conversations about this, it's killing people. And we've got to have that in the forefront. And although I'm not a great fan of Simon Stevens of NHS England, he came in to his post already talking about race. He came in saying, we need the data and the measures to hold people accountable. And I think Jemima said something, one of the things is CQC. But I think the Health and Race Observatory is really looking into this. What is it we can measure realistically? And get rid of the leaders that don't want to do, that don't want to work with this, that don't want to create change, because they will just keep the status quo going. And it's important that we have accountability and the measures that let us know if you're doing what you said you were going to do, if you are tackling this race inequality issue, not just for your staff, but for the public that your staff serve. Are you really reaching into that? And that's very important. But I think I'm going to end with two things, really. Two authors who really get me every time I hear their quotes. One of them is James Baldwin, who says, we can have difference and love each other unless your difference is oppressing me then we cannot just love each other and disagree. You have to change because it's killing me. And Toni Morrison says, and we keep doing this, we fall into this trap all the time as BAME people, we keep qualifying why we should have equality. 
we keep qualifying that and that's the distraction of these conversations when there's no clear outcomes and i truly believe change will happen but i think i'll be long dead before i see something that truly has some substance because it's a long haul this it's a long journey and we keep stepping back because we keep revisiting racism agreed Lot, lots of agreements there completely thank you so much sharon Um, I mean, Mushala has just sort of really said it, what I would want to say really, I think for me, it's just, you know, why not, we should, we, it's not about why we should be doing something about this, it's, it's why are we not doing something, you know, if the will's not there, why is it not there, this is, this is uh, for me, it, it, it's, it's a conversation that we're having and it's great, but it, it's still, it's still really sad that we have to have it and I think, it's come to a point where this isn't this is a this is a moral obligation on on the, on the professions on the nhs on you know this is about e equality it's, it's it's not it's, it's not something that should be this difficult to kind of achieve change on it really shouldn't be so i kind of for me it's just you know kind of really looking at it from at every level from students to kind of sort of starting for people to you know think about unconscious bias right from student level because those students are within the two three years of qualifying they start to be recruiting you know the band six therapists is recruiting those you know and then their bias kind of then comes into play in terms of who the next level of clinicians coming through and then before we know it they've, they've gone into leadership roles and we're kind of just going around in circles so i think it's important that this is a conversation that's had at all levels um, and that, but it, that it starts with a really basic question of why not, you know, why are we not doing this? You, this, is, this, is, this is just basic kind of um, rights and about what, being in a society of equal opportunity. It, should, it really shouldn't be something that's, that's this, this difficult. It really shouldn't. Completely agreed. So this is our ask now that people have listened to this, who have learned from this. There will be a uh, podcast three that comes out on the same ilk with this beautiful, amazing panel. And if like, uh, I can't remember who said it, but look at all the inspiring role models you have around you. And this is what we need to grow. We need to grow this visible network about inspirational role models and what that can achieve. And if we come together and work together for long lasting systemic change. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for the time. I really appreciate it.